Good morning. Welcome to Integrity Church. I'm Sandy. I'm Rich. Enjoy, Enjoy the, the service. service. Hey, thanks so much for joining with us. We are thankful to be able to worship alongside you. Hey, we're getting real close to our public regathering together. I know that many of you like me have been waiting, indeed longing for us to be together and uh, be able to hear one another worship and, 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 and greet each other. And so just to mark your calendars, July 12th is when we will be gathering together. We're gonna be updating our website as more and more details become made known to us, we will certainly be making them known to you as far as how specifically we will be meeting. So be sure to check our website. If um, you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, today we're gonna continue our second part of the source of conflict, the war that rages within us. And um, we're gonna let the Word of God challenge our hearts and minds. But before we do that, Let's jump into a time of worshiping the Lord together. Let's prepare our hearts and enter into the sanctuary of our hearts. We come into your presence this morning, Lord, to bring you praise and worship your name in the midst of everything that's going on. We put that all to the side right now come into your presence and to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory that's due your name as one people, because you're such a good father and you're worthy to be praised.
angels cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. See.
Hey, we're going to continue worshiping the Lord together in our giving. You know, it's sometimes it's it's really hard to make the connection between giving and worship. But you know what? Sometimes when we're releasing those resources that God has given to us as an expression of his ownership, it is nothing more than just an act of worship because sometimes it's hard to do. And uh, But I know God is pleased in that. And I just thank you for your, your faithfulness and your generosity towards the church. And uh, we seek to honor the Lord with every penny that gets given uh, to the church so that we might advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so let's pray. Father, thank you um, for your generosity. Lord, thanks for uh, allowing us to um, be the recipients of your grace. And uh, Lord, as we come to you with our tithes and offerings, we pray, God, that you would uh, bless it, that you'd multiply it so that we might use those funds to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world today. Uh, Lord, bless back your people, I pray, in Christ's name. Uh, thanks for standing with us in partnership. Good morning. Thanks for tuning in. We are going back to where we left off last week. We've been looking at the source of conflict that James raises our awareness to in James chapter 4. And, and in that passage of scripture, he, he opens up James chapter 4 with a, an interesting question that perhaps we have found ourselves asking uh, one time or another. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Have you found yourself there at one time or another? You think to yourself, how did we get here? Why do we always seem to be fighting? Why do we always argue over these different points? What is going on inside of me that causes us sometimes to be so argumentative? And, and we looked at that last week, and James answers that very question that he asks. And he says, is it not the passions that are at war within you? We looked at that last week and we identified the, the very fact that there is in fact a war that goes on within us. The, this war between knowing what we ought to do and actually doing what we ought to do. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter seven. He, he says something that I think we all can identify with at one time or another. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And the things that I don't want to do or the things that I do want to do, those are the very things I don't do. And he highlights the fact that there's this, this war that's going on within him. The desire to do the right thing versus the reality that sometimes he just doesn't do it. And then he, ple he pleads in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so Paul identifies the very real struggle that Christians deal with on a regular basis. Sometimes we know what we ought to do. We deeply feel strong about the right thing, but there are times where the ways of our past prior to Christ begin to influence our new ways. And we talked about that last week, and, and we, we saw with, with hard words that James addresses the, the compromise and the, the prayerlessness within the church, and, and he highlights the importance to, of, of turning from those things and turning to God. And we talked about this, this idea of how do we not allow the ways of the past to continue to influence this new nature, this new identity that we have in Jesus Christ. James presents the problem in verses 1 through 6. And thankfully, he doesn't just keep us feeling hopeless. He doesn't just kick us to the curb feeling like trash. But thankfully, we see that God is at work even in the midst of our disobedience. And anytime God is in the mix, there's always hope. 
No matter how many things may look, no matter how you may feel, no matter how or what anybody says, when Jesus is involved, there's always hope. And hope is directly connected to grace. And that's what James points our attention to. God's grace is his unmerited favor. It's something we can't earn. It, it flows from God. James says that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so James is, is addressing the source of conflict, as we saw last week, the war that, that rages within us, this war that I think many of us can identify with at one time or another. We, we, and what a, what a tremendous picture that he gives to us. It's not just a, it's not just a struggle. It's, a, it's an all-out war sometimes. And it's raging between the things that we should do and the things that we end up doing. There's this battle. How do we fight against this war that rages? How do we not fall prey to what we once were? How do we walk in obedience? What ought our posture to be before God so that the life of Christ can in fact be lived out in us? How do we silence and, and win over the sinful passions that exist within us? And it's there that we left off. Because what James does is he points us to go to God as our, own, our only source. It is not self-help, it is God-help. It's going to Christ, the one who is our great sin-bearer and our great solution-maker. Let's take a look at what he says. James chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against the brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? And we left off, we left off last week asking the question, how do we fight against this war that rages within? How do we not fall prey to our old ways, our default settings that are in, in direct opposition to this new nature we have received in Jesus Christ? How do I allow the life of Christ to be lived out in such a way that I'm not pulled back into my old ways. And James highlights 10 different things in this passage of scripture that I want to highlight to us. He says the first thing we must do, he says, submit yourselves therefore to God in verse seven. Submit yourselves therefore to God. In other words, James is saying, give up. Stop fighting to get your way. Stop fighting to, to win your arguments. Just submit to God, we by nature do not like to submit to anything. It's when we, when we relinquish control is what sets us up for the blessing of God in our life. James's first instruct to us is submit yourself to God. Have you found yourself in times where you felt like you were running and fighting and nothing was going right and everything seemed to be conflict and nothing was working the way you wanted it to work and you finally get to that point where you just throw yourself before God and just submit. Stop orchestrating outcomes. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Step number one. Number two, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I love that. Resist the devil 
and he will flee. Remember what he talked about, the influence, the ungodly wisdom is oftentimes influenced by, de- by the demonic. And what, what James says to us here is resist the devil and he will flee. We need to be really careful that we don't give the devil any more time or any more um, of our attention than is necessary. The best way to combat the devil is to resist him. Resist the devil and he will flee. What does that look like? It means that when those thoughts that come into your mind to do something that are contrary to what God would have you to do, resist them. Just say no. To use a catchphrase from the past. But our no needs to be so firm that there's no room for a maybe in it. Resist the devil and he will flee. The moment we begin to meander or ponder or negotiate on on areas of, of compromise, we have opened the door to being influenced by the enemy. And our no needs to be hard, it needs to be firm, it needs to be quick. And when those thoughts that are entering that are contrary to what the word of God says of us, we need to say, no, resist the devil. And when he sees that there is not a foothold, when he sees there's no room for compromise in your heart, he will flee. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Submitting ourselves to God is when we're looking to God and turning our back and resist in resistance towards the devil. And then James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. What a wonderful invitation. Hebrews encourages us, us to draw boldly to the throne of grace to come and draw near to God. What an invitation, something apart from Christ that is impossible to do. Christ came, Christ lived a perfect life. Christ took upon the sins of the world and went to the cross so that you and I can draw near to God. Because apart from Christ, man is separated from from God, but now, comes the invitation, we can draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This instruction is something that we see all throughout the scripture. We see the scripture calls us to um, um, seek the Lord while he may be found. Search the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. If you'll seek me, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. All throughout, listen, God loves when his children pursue him. And in the midst of those wars that are raging on the inside, it's time that we relinquish control, we resist the enemy, and we draw near to God. There's so many voices that are screaming so loudly around us in our culture. We need to be careful that we don't allow those voices to drown out the voice of God in our life. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And as you draw near to God, look at the instruction. He says, cleanse your hands. You see, you can't draw near to God and not become aware of your own sin. You cannot draw near. And here's the thing. When you draw near to God, you become aware of your own sin. And to the degree that you become aware of your own sin, you find yourself less in conflict with other people because you find yourself a lot more gracious to people who are as sinful as you are. Draw near to God. And then he says, and as you're drawing near, cleanse your hands. I'm reminded of when Isaiah, as he stood before the presence of God in Isaiah chapter six, and he sees the glory of God and, the, and, and, he, and, 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 he, and he sees the, the, the angels and the seraphim and, and they're flying and they're crying out, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And he has a, has a, a, a he's in the presence of God. And as he draws near to God, his response is, woe is me, 
for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. You see, as we draw near to God, we become aware of our own sin. And when we become aware of our own sin, we tend to be a little bit more understanding of people who are equally as imperfect as we are. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And when you draw near to God, then the challenge is cleanse your hands. In other words, repent of your sin. Turn from your ways. Look what he says here. Purify your hearts. In other words, stay single-minded because the appeal is purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so the appeal is stay single-minded. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, James says earlier on. But he calls us to cleanse our hands, purify our hearts, come to God in repentance and, and with a single-focused heart giving him our all, and repent over our sin. Now look what he says here. Be wretched, be, re- be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. What is he saying here? He's saying realize the seriousness of sin. Let your laughter be turned to to mourning. People ought to be ashamed at what they laugh at today, what they tolerate today, things that are are opposed to the holiness of God, the jokes and the mischaracterizations and the treatment of one another, of people who are made in the image of God. Something that oftentimes is just laughed off and what James says is, turn your, let your laughter be turned to mourning. In other words, get a fear of God and an awareness of the seriousness of our sin. And then number eight, he says, humble yourself before the Lord. Humble yourself before the Lord. Recognize who you are apart from God and now in God. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. If you humble yourself before the Lord, you don't need to exalt yourself. You humble yourself before the Lord, you don't need to self-promote. You humble yourself before, before the Lord, you don't need to fight your own battles or, 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 or create uh, your own outcomes. Exalt, humble yourself before the Lord and God will exalt you. God will put you where God wants you to be. Humble yourself before the Lord. Then he says, don't speak evil of one another. Why? Because it's contrary to our nature. Don't speak evil of people who have been made in the image and likeness of God. Don't miscategorize people and lump everybody into a specific group just because you agree or disagree with them. Don't speak evil of people. You can disagree with people, but you cannot cheapen who they are as God's creation made in his image. Don't speak evil of one another. It's contrary to your nature. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. And what he's saying here is don't put yourself in a position of being a judge because you are as imperfect as the person that you are judging. There is only one lawgiver and one judge He who is able to save and to destroy. Who is he speaking of? He's speaking of Jesus. He's speaking of only God is in a position to truly and rightly judge. In other words, the last one is, let God be the discerner of hearts, not you. One of the ways in which you can avoid conflict and arguings and fights is if you'll not determine what's going on in the heart of another person. 
Don't be the discerner of another person's heart. Let God be the discerner of, the, of a person's heart. Only God is capable of knowing a person's heart. And then he says, but who are you to judge your neighbor? What James is saying here is see yourself rightly. Know where you came from. And now know who you are in Christ. And live your life in such a way that the life of Christ can be lived out. That you might be a, a minister of reconciliation. A reflection of the love of God. The salt of the earth. The light of the world. But we'll never do that if we are juggling between obedience and disobedience, compromise and no compromise, old nature and new nature. Resist the devil. Let our no be so firm that there's no room for a maybe in it. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will raise you up. And I think as we, as we submit ourselves to the Lord and we draw near to God, God will give us the wisdom that we need as we talked back a couple of weeks ago, the wisdom that is, that is from above. And he'll allow us and, in, and, and empower us to be a useful tool in his hands today to bring the gospel, the solution that all people truly need, that there's hope in Jesus Christ. Hey parents, make sure your kids check back in at 11.15 for a digital kid zone service. Don't have them miss it. Good morning everyone and welcome to Integrity Church Online this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so happy that you are here. We have had a wonderful experience together online Sunday mornings at integritychurch.online for our 10 a.m. services. Um, and something that you can start looking forward to is July 12th. We will be reconvening back at the church. So if you need any more details about that, you can go online on our website. Also this week, we have our last Red Sea Rules Bible study on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. So if you haven't joined us for that before, it's a great way to come together and get a little bit encouragement for some tough times that we may be going through right now. Um, also, we still have our Connect card online, which if you don't know, is a great place for you to connect in any way, any way that you're feeling, whether it's your first or second visit, um, or if you're just looking to get involved in the church or there's something on your heart that you want to connect in, that's a great place for that. And please keep continuing to utilize our prayer requests for whatever individual prayer needs that you have. We are all here for you, willing to pray for you, and I hope that you feel that community from Integrity Church. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Love you guys. Bye. Thanks, Connie. James chapter 4 packs quite a punch, doesn't it? He starts off with, you adulterous generation. Wow. Doesn't that get your attention? James is passionately serious about how important it is to live out our faith God's way and not to settle for what the world promises to bring satisfaction to our lives. Thankfully, we don't have to wonder what God's ways are as James spells them out so beautifully in his epistle. So I pray that as we go about our week, we would find ourselves submitting more to God, resisting the devil, and purifying our hearts and minds as we turn over any thoughts and patterns that are contrary to God's. But when we do, there's no doubt that we will be used by God to influence this world for its good and for God's glory. I'm so looking forward to seeing you all soon. God bless you. Have a great day.